Namaste and in La Catch, and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefield, and as always, I'm going to explain those two phrases in case you aren't aware of them. They both come from ancient languages. Namaste comes from the Sanskrit, spoken it means Brahmi, or it's called Brahmi, and it means the divine in me recognizes the divine in you. In La Catch comes from the other side of the world, the Mayan civilization, and guess what it means? I am another you. So here's two ancient phrases, thousands of years old. If we can take those in, recognize those in ourselves, and give that to others as we greet them in our daily travels, what a difference it can make. Don't believe me? Try it out for yourself, right? So this week's guest is George Chanos. He is an amazing man. He's an author, an attorney, a speaker, a futurist. He was a form, or is a former attorney general for the great state of Nevada. He is the founder of People Rain, which is an artist NFT collaboration. He's an author of two books, Seize Your Destiny, A Roadmap to Success, and Millennial Samurai, A Mindset for the 21st Century. And he got his jurisprudence from the University of San Diego Law School. George, glad to have you here. Thank you. It's nice to be here. You're welcome. Uh, pleasure, absolutely. So in the tradition of One World in a New World, we look at, you know, kind of the history of when you began to understand that there was another, there was an inside part of your life. We live half inside, half outside. And I think once people begin to kind of realize that, that they find out that, yes, that's true. So how did you first get in touch with that inner side in the way that maybe you can remember or recognize it in your early life sure well as we as we discussed a little bit earlier i'm uh perhaps not as introspective as as you are um, um but i do believe that um there has always been something that has um spoken to me mm -hmm. in terms of um i guess uh offering some kind of guidance or direction um, I, uh, when I was uh, very young, I was uh, six years old, um, I was in the car with my mom and we were driving down Paradise Road and it came over the radio that JFK had been assassinated. I remember that. And my mom pulled the car to the side of the road and started crying. And as a six-year-old boy, um, watching his mom, you know, cry hysterically over something that was coming over the radio. It had an impression on me and we went back to our little apartment and watched uh, the international news coverage of this fallen hero and uh, the outpouring of grief um, for this fallen hero. And at that moment, um, I decided uh, throughout you know, that period of uh, several weeks, I decided that I wanted to be that man. I wanted to be president of the United States. And minus the assassination, of course. Yeah, well, even even notwithstanding the assassination. So. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that because you, in my opinion, and possibly yours too, you have to be willing to give your life for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know what it was. I haven't really tried to, you know, psychoanalyze myself and try so to. You, but it was a gut feeling. And yeah, yeah. That's it, really all that matters. Yeah, it was it was definitely an intuitive gut feeling um, that this is something that spoke to me and something that I thought was uh, a worthy life. Um, I think we all um, probably deep down want a worthy life. We want to have uh, our life have meaning. Uh, we want to accomplish something important in our lives, if possible. We want to uh, live a enjoyable and blissful life to the extent possible. Um, and so this spoke to me as, as a life worth living, even if it ended in assassination, that was okay. It was mm -hmm. still a life worth living. And um, so, yeah, that, uh, that was an early moment for me. Um, I've had a couple of epiphany moments like that. I was, uh, I had another epiphany moment when I was in my, I was 20 and I was in Washington, DC. I was in the Russell Senate office building. The elevator doors opened up and in walked the Abscam co-conspirators. 
to resign in front of an international press corps in public disgrace. That also had a, uh, a big impact on me. It told me that I did not want to be one of these people. Right. So at six, I wanted to be president, but at 20, I did not want to be one of these disgraced politicians. And so that sent my life in a, uh, a somewhat different direction where instead of moving headstrong into politics from 20 forward, um, I instead decided that what I needed to do before I entered politics. Get a little harder. <laughs> I, need, I needed to bulletproof myself. Yeah, I, yeah. I needed to go out and make enough money so that I could sit in front of anyone who might try to corrupt or influence me and be able to um, say no. And, uh, and so I did that. Um, I went out and uh, I had a very successful career financially, both in, in the law and real estate and in business. And ultimately it came full circle and I had an opportunity to serve as Nevada's attorney general. Um, I was approached um, the former attorney general was retiring to become a federal judge and uh, created a two-year vacancy. The governor was empowered to appoint his replacement. And he, he reached out to the managing director of the state's largest law firm to find the replacement. And that gentleman, uh, a man named Joe Brown, reached out to me and said, uh, George, I think you'd be great. And it shot me back to when I was six. I was a uh, practicing lawyer at the time. I had my firm. I was uh, doing quite well. And uh, it would mean shutting down my firm and taking a huge pay cut to become Nevada's attorney general. And uh, it shot me back to when I was six. And it shot me back to when I was 20, because at this point in my life, I had just done a big real estate deal. And I had just made millions of dollars on this real estate deal. And so I thought, well, I'm finally there. I'm at a point. You are, yeah. You know, I've met all the conditions. I have the money. I can sit across the table from anybody and say, I don't need your money. And uh, maybe, you know, it's not maybe. This is my time. This is yeah, what I need yeah. to do. This, this now, if we time. could for just a moment, if I can interrupt you, yeah. and talk about this, unpacking this just a, a little bit yeah. of how this early gut feeling, intuitive knowing locked in a process that you weren't necessarily aware of at the time. However, it carried through to the place where that innocent, naive um, acknowledgement of who you wanted to be then took a, a circuitous route that got you there over time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So these are some of the things that I like to illustrate of how we can look back in our lives and, and maybe get more in touch, especially now in, in these coming out of times, we can go back and look at, okay, where did I connect? How did I connect? What was that feeling? Where did I want to go? And am I there yet? And if not, what can I do to get there? Sure. Right. I mean, and all has to do with service. Yeah, you and I are, are having a conversation because of a heart attack that I had in 2012. I had a, in 2012, I had a heart attack and uh, made me understand that life is fleeting. And uh, um, um, that I was vulnerable to another heart attack and that I could pass. And at the time, my daughter was 15 years old. And um, I was very concerned about leaving her without proper guidance and direction. So I wanted to try to download my knowledge in the event of my death. Mm -hmm. And so I began to write a letter to her. And that letter ultimately turned into my first book, uh, Seize Your Destiny, A Roadmap to Success. And then I realized that what I had done was I had successfully downloaded my knowledge into that book. Um, but that it was about the life that I had lived over the prior 30 years. It wasn't about the life that she was going to live over the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. so that became a journey uh, um, where I've spent the last 10 years from 2012 to today um, researching and studying what is going to happen over the next 30 years to be able to be in a position to advise my daughter on that subject and that only makes sense, right? I mean, from the really gut level core, okay, where am I going to go? You need to kind of look at where the trends are headed. And thank you for that. And also, 
uh, my wife and I have this little digital game that when we say things of importance that, you know, we get indicators from one of our phones or computer or something that just kind of dings or chimes in like <laughs> it's one of those serendipitous synchronistic moments i i uh, hope that doesn't keep happening i'm trying to turn these things off oh that, that's fine because that was perfectly timed oh yeah okay so and these are the kinds of subtle things the subtle uh points of awareness that we can have of things fitting together better Right, because our minds, we got 70,000 thoughts a day. How do we manage those and put them in line with our uh, passion and purpose, let's say? Um, so these kinds of things just was were present for you to be able to not only look at your life, look at where you were at, share with your daughter, but also get a view of the future in order to better prepare yourself for it and, uh, and to share that with others as well. That's a phenomenal path to take for anybody. Um, so I, I honor that and, in humble to be, and am humbled to be in the presence of that as well. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. So in that process, then, as you're looking to the, the future and understanding the, the very mm, nitty-gritty, I guess, of the, the preparation for that, what were some of the things coming up? And I find it interesting you had your heart attack in 2012 because for many people, that was a, a shifting point of the, the winter solstice of 2012, Mayan calendar, you know, shift between Piscean and Aquarian age, all, all this kind of stuff. A lot of people were paying attention to that. My father actually passed on New Year's, or I'm sorry, Christmas Eve day in 2012. So there was a lot of significant stuff for me as well so coming out of that then what what was your motivating factor and, and how did that roll out so when i started looking at uh, what was going to happen over the next 30 years um i was amazed at what i saw um you know we we really don't know much about what we aren't looking at right what we have <laughs> sure what we haven't studied Right? Well, like Einstein says, you know, you can't fix the problems that were created with the same thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or Sheryl Sandberg, uh, who said that uh, uh, you cannot change that which you are unaware of. But once you are aware, you cannot help but change. And Absolutely. so creating awareness is, is critical, right? Before you can solve a problem, you have to be aware of the problem. And you have to understand the problem. So and be vulnerable enough to know that it is a problem you don't have answers for. Yeah, yeah. So I started looking at, uh, um, out of curiosity, on behalf of my daughter, I started looking at what was going to happen over the next 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, and 30 years. And um, what I saw was that uh, I saw Stephen Hawking in 2014, a theoretical physicist, uh, talking about the singularity, the moment in time when machine intelligence would eclipse human intelligence as being the greatest event in human history, greater than fire, greater than the wheel, greater than anything that man has ever conceived of. Kind of like the matrix where the, the machine world takes over. Yeah, well, you know, whatever the consequences of it may be. Right. The idea, or could take over. Okay. Yeah, the idea is that uh, machine intelligence will, in fact, eclipse human intelligence. Ray Kurzweil, who's the head of artificial intelligence for Google, um, who Bill Gates says knows more about artificial intelligence than anyone he knows. Um, Kurzweil has been making predictions since the 1990s. He's been over 80% correct in the predictions that he's made. And he suggests that the singularity, that moment in time that Hawking was talking about, will come as early as 2029, which is seven years away. Hmm. And uh, so imagine the greatest event in human history happening, um, you know. Uh, in the seven, near future. Yeah, yeah, in the near future. Whether it's seven years, whether it's 17 years, it's coming. And it's coming like a freight train. And, um, and the change, uh, and then Kurzweil goes on to say, what he, what he goes on to say is even more uh, incredible. He says that by the 2040s, which is 20 to 30 years away, Artificial intelligence will not be our equal. It will be a billion times more capable than human intelligence, a billion times. So, um, you know, 
the human brain doesn't even have the capacity to fathom what a, an intelligence that is a billion times our own might mean. You know, whether it means that machines take over, whether it means that we are transformed into a different form of being, um, you know, I certainly can't, uh, wouldn't even begin to try to predict uh, what all of this is going to mean for humanity. Right. Um, but I do know this much. Um, I have, for the last 30 years, been a complex problem solver. That's what people have, that's how I've made a living right? People have hired me to solve complex problems. And the way I solve complex problems uh, throughout that entire period, there was a, a great book you may have read called Ogilvy on Advertising. Oh, good it. to go. Absolutely. Yeah. I read it when I was 12. Uh, David Ogilvy, uh, who's uh, been uh, called the father of advertising, uh, wrote that book. And in it, he talked about what he called a helicopter perspective. And a helicopter perspective is essentially the ability to rise above a situation and to look at it from 360 degrees, to look at it from all angles. And so that's how I've solved complex problems for the past 30 years. I've used a helicopter perspective. I've risen above the problems. I've looked at them from as many angles as I possibly could, trying to understand them as deeply as I can from as many different perspectives as I can. And through that process, I've gained a, a better understanding of a problem, and I've been able to add to that approach creativity in option generation and solve problems by developing and creating options that are best suited to the resolution of those problems mm -hmm. once I fully understand the problems. So in, in doing that, one of the things that you do when you're solving problems and you're advising people is you, you have to look beyond the horizon because if someone is, is, is forming a business or they're uh, forming a partnership or they're in, about to engage in a certain endeavor, you want to look ahead and you want to see where this is going and you want to see if it's going to play out well to the greatest extent possible. So you become adept at looking beyond the horizon. You become right. adept at looking for red flags. Right. Right. And you're also looking at that. There's no gentleman I read some time ago, wrote a book called um, Ambidextrous Organizations. And, and so that's a kind of a twofold, two pronged approach looking at in business, you want to exploit, first of all, that, that's part of it. But the other side is exploration. And businesses don't often include the two until that exploitation is run out. Right. Instead of having them in tandem, which right. is kind of what you're talking about. Well, so when I, when I look past the horizon uh, to try to see red flags, what I can tell you is that as I'm looking at the world today and I'm looking past the horizon, uh, even on the horizon, I see many red flags. Um, I see a, a world that is changing rapidly and radically that holds tremendous promise, but also tremendous peril. Sure. And, and, um, and that, I believe that humanity is at a tipping point and that we will either move into a second enlightenment where we will harness this technology for humanity's benefit and we will uh, um, arise out of this uh, present circumstance to be uh, a more glorious uh, society and, right. and Planet. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to key off that more glorious society and offer this in that um, Dr. Laszlo, I don't know if you're familiar with Irvin Laszlo, um, nominated twice for the Global, or, uh, World Peace Prize, Nobel Peace Prize, I'm sorry, uh, 90 years old now. He's known as the grandfather of quantum systems thinking. And with some of the things he's talking about, mainly the higher self being present, in that decision-making process and paying attention to it rather than anything, you know, fear-based. And then there's uh, Howard, uh, Vernon Neppe and Edward Close who wrote a quantum physics theory of everything paper published in 2010 that simply stated consciousness, space, and time are tethered across nine dimensions of consciousness. That, that doesn't exclude other dimensions, but it 
encapsulates our human experience in those nine. And so as we are becoming aware of those other nine, which most of us aren't yet, some of us have, you know, the, the gut feeling experiences, some of us have uh, liminal space experience, which is the liminal space is kind of the segue between dimensions. Let's say, for example, dream state and waking state, and you're in this place where you're kind of experiencing both, where you might have a dream that just kind of bleeds over into the waking reality, right? That's, that's a liminal space experience. So as we begin to understand these things and all the adventures of consciousness that writers and authors and, and explorers, pioneers are talking about now in the development, even uh, Valentina Morovina, who is a Russian academia, she has uh, two degrees, one in astrophysics and one in microbiology. She's done a 10 year study of the evidence, the scientific evidence of what many are calling the ascension process in humanity. And she titles her dissertation, The Global Mutation in Humanity. And she, and she lays out all the, the scientific evidence of it, which is phenomenal. It's Russian, uh, it, and my wife, who's from St. Petersburg, found it, shared it with me because it had English subtitles. But she's saying the same thing. Mal, you know, there's many of us, and this is what my goal is for One World, a New World, is to show how we're all saying very similar things. And, and now that being aware, we can then begin to explore with each other as to how we can take that to the next level and actually perform what you're talking about in being able to manage the technology for our betterment instead of being controlled by it. Yeah. When I, when I listen to, um, to that, to what you just said, um, mm -hmm. it, it is a, um, it speaks to a higher level of consciousness, mm -hmm. right? And um, I, uh, I had an interesting uh, um, post the other day and someone commented on it, um, something to the effect of, you know, understand, understand problems and then move at them with, you know, intention and, and, ex and excellence and critical thinking. And um, someone commented that you might be expecting too much, right? And, and what you're talking about, what you're talking about is, you know, basically, um, from my perspective, it's, it's playing the chess game further out. And it's talking about self-actualization. Self is is essentially the area that you're in yeah kind of two two forms of it there, there's two things there's self-actualization self-realization actualization is the is the outer we were talking about living inside and outside earlier actualization is the outer for lack of a better manifestation of your perfected form fit and function in the world as designed Right. The self-realization is the inner awareness of the magnitude of your being across those nine <laughs> dimensions and more. Right. So what I would say, what I would suggest is that, that um, humanity, uh, that, that the goal that you're establishing is a great goal, um, but it's further down the road mm -hmm. than... than um, Perhaps. Yeah, that, that, that essentially that... Um, that today um, we're faced with some very real challenges that are going to impact us like a tsunami over the next decade. What and, do you feel that those are? Well, okay, so hold on a second. So, so, sure. so what I would- Jumping I, ahead. Yeah, so what I, well, <laughs> that's kind of uh, um, consistent with the overall, with the overall philosophy right. is, is, is being ahead. Right. And it's not bad to be ahead. It's good to be ahead. You got to um, recognize the moment. Yeah, so I'm just saying that, that right now we've got some very immediate concerns and we need to raise our game. We need to raise, raise our game um, and not everyone is going to be able to do it to the degree that you're- Is it really necessary that they do? Because in the hierarchical structure of a distribution or a division of labor, so to speak, that's not necessary. As long as the, the processes, patterns, um, systems things are, are in place then it's not necessarily what we work with it's how we work with it and and the the individuals in the the lower part of the pyramid don't or hierarchy 
don't necessarily have to understand the depth because they're still doing the same thing. It's just with a little different awareness of where it's going to go. Yeah. So the awareness that I would, uh, would create, uh, feel that needs to be created right now in the moment is the fact that, um, you know, we need to perform at a higher level. Mm -hmm. um, in order to survive and thrive and in order to capitalize on the opportunities that are going to come our way um, and in order to overcome the challenges that are going to come our way um, very quickly um, we need to raise our game and uh, we do that by first of all creating awareness of a sense of urgency of understanding that um, change is coming it's going to require uh, continuous adaptation and lifelong learning, and um, that it's going to uh, visit us at an ever-increasing, accelerating rate, mm -hmm. and that adaptation and resilience and anti-fragility are going to be um, some of the most important things that we can learn um, and, and practice. And so, you know, some of the things you ask, what, you know, what's coming? Um, well, automation, for example, today, McKinsey and Company says that 47.5% of all jobs that currently exist are susceptible to automation based on existing technology, mm -hmm. right? So what's here today can essentially replace half the jobs, right, right in terms of automation. What's coming will over the next 10 to 20 years, we'll be able to replace a much higher percentage of jobs, you know, maybe on the magnitude of an 80 to 90% of all employment, just like in the industrial revolution, 90% of the public was involved in farming, agriculture, right? right? And now, you know, it's less than 10%, right? So there's, there was this huge transition of what we were doing um, and what we then came to do as a consequence of the industrial revolution. We now are in a, the midst of a technological revolution that will dwarf the industrial revolution. And so the employment that we now take for granted as being, you know, uh, something that uh, um, occupies our time. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of like Moore's equation on steroids. Yeah, exactly. The Moore's law on steroids. Yeah. So this now, is all going to change. It's all going to change very rapidly and very radically. Yeah. Well, and we can see it, especially coming out of, of the last couple of years where the, you know, even Schwab says that agility is essential for businesses to survive, let alone flourish. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, right. Now in this also, um, I understand, you know, the fear for loss of job, right? That's the first thing that's going to come up in the public. The second thing, though, that I think is an unintended consequence that will really embellish our civilization, and that is the freedom to explore ourselves more, the culture, the art, music, um, consciousness, the things that really take a civilization to a next level. Because we're, we are a planetary civilization. We're one of many. We're being visited by others. We all know that. Um, what kind of... of consciousness they have and they may be just like the ai a billion times more intelligent than we are having had millions of years to do so yeah right? and that perhaps maybe there's helping to seed through the visions dreams whatever telepathy many report this idea that yes we can learn to work together better and that as our experience of time shifts from being linear to being non-linear and non-local which essentially means and this is how i've heard they say that they measure time is a change of entropy right so in that change of entropy it, it essentially as you become more aware that entropy lessens and time truncates in order to get things done so it, it's amazing just to even conceive that what that might look like look yeah. like in this evolutionary process yeah well the other you know the point that um that you raise about people having more time to be introspective and people having more time for art and for literature and for uh creation 
um, you know, is a possible future. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we have the ability to move from where we are today. We have the technology to move from where we are today into literally a second enlightenment, right? Where, right, right. where provided we make the right choices. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, people like, um, uh, um, Gabriel René and, uh, and Dan Mapes, who wrote The Spatial Web, talk about um, technology creating increased abundance. Uh, mm -hmm. They're predicting a 10xing of the global GDP from a, uh, 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 an $80 trillion uh, global GDP to an $800 trillion dollar global GDP. Well, imagine just in one instance with distribution systems being further defined, automated, um, being able to serve, you know, poverty on that yeah, level, they're talking would, about would greatly decrease. Yeah, they're talking about trillions of uh, sensors, trillions of sensors being connected to essentially everything mm -hmm. that will increase, radically increase efficiency all forms of transportation and distribution and production um, will be enhanced um, by this uh, uh, sensor, this internet of things, this right. connectivity. And I can also see, that's a, a just a grand vision, right? And I can, you can just imagine, I know IBM's been working on smarter cities and having all the um, automated sensors in the pavement so that the self-driving cars can be more effective. You know, because we're not going to get away. We think we can get away from fossil fuels. We're not going to. That that's that requires so much retrofitting of millions, billions of vehicles. Not going to happen. What can happen, though, is those vehicles can be made wiser and use less fuel through this automation process. In my opinion. Yeah. So there will be there will be um, massive change mm -hmm. um, and massive increases in efficiency. And that increase, those increases in, in efficiency will create abundance. And that abundance um, can be distributed um, in the form of a universal basic income, for example. Right. It could give people more time to explore their intuitive nature, their creativity, uh, you know, uh, their, their, um, their goals and aspirations. Right, you know, right. And that can that. affect things such as um, in, you know, we met through the live and let live organization and our, we've got seven, eight chapters in Africa and which are really doing more than we've got 30 some chapters around the world right now, but these particular chapters are really demonstrating how to work together, uniting as leaders, talking about what's necessary, how to work together. Because in Africa right now, there's a 1.4 billion people and almost 500 million of them make less than a dollar a day. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, um, the opportunities for changing those types of conditions and improving those types of conditions globally Mm -hmm. uh, for erasing hunger, for eliminating illiteracy, um, for giving people um, uh, a means of subsistence. Mm -hmm. uh, these things, uh, universal health care, universal education, all of these things are possible. Um, and we have the technology and we, we are coming into even more technology that will make that even more possible. So is it possible then that we're moving from an agenda of profit over people and planet, which has been to people and planet over profit? Doesn't do away with the profit, just redistributes it. Yeah, some are. Some are moving in that direction um, and, uh, and some aren't. Um, and ultimately, I guess that will be the test of mm -hmm. whether or not, uh, you know, where we end up. And voluntary contribution, so to speak. Well, whether whether it's a whether it's a um, a practice of uh, of cooperation and collaboration uh, towards our uh, our shared goals, uh, the advancement of our shared goals, the advancement of our planetary goals, or whether or not it is every man for himself, um, where there is a dystopian fear that uh, overcomes us and, and causes us to compete. Which uh, is what the narrative of the last, you know, couple of years ago began. 
in an attempt. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the war in Ukraine and uh, the situation in in, in Taiwan um, are not um, indicators of cooperation. They're just the opposite, right? Doesn't things like or don't things like that happen right on the cusp of change where you know certain it's like chaos which chaos really isn't chaos it's just patterns we don't recognize yet uh, that that actually happens you know it's like let's let me uh divert for just a or digress for just a moment talking about the shift between the aquarian and piscean ages there is a school of thought that in that rise of awareness and consciousness that became the tipping point of the winter solstice of 2012, then what happens? Well, you've got the awareness and consciousness, so you carry it everywhere. That's going to shift subtly every place you visit, every person you encounter. So what that facilitates in, in a short or long amount of time, depending, you know, five to 10 years, is that all the things that don't resonate with that better way that is consistent with the awareness and consciousness, those things come to the surface for recognition first to become aware of and to be so ubiquitously present that you, you know, even a blind person can see it, right? Kind of thing, which essentially is what's happened over the last decade. So now we're, we're rising to this next level. So how do you see that proceeding? Well, I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure that. Great uh, answer. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the possibilities not, are. Yeah, well, the possibilities are that uh, um, we wake up and recognize our profound interdependence with one another globally, and uh, we work towards a cooperative and collaborative solution uh, that advances humanity's interests in a way that creates increased abundance. Um, and creates uh, peace and prosperity um, for more people, um, hopefully for all people. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the possibility that, uh, um, you know, this, uh, I mean, in 2017, Putin, uh, Vladimir Putin ominously said that he who controls AI will control the world because they will be able to subjugate all other uh, nations. Mm -hmm. And, and so um, there is a dystopian side to this, right? There is a race that is uh, currently underway between um, primarily the United States and China um, for the development of AI and quantum supremacy. And, um, you know, there are some people who believe that there will only be one winner in that, right? That one uh, power will emerge with a breakthrough in that area that allows them to um, essentially stifle or, or uh, halt the progress of other nations that are competing in the same area and giving that one nation uh, unlimited power. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, and if the United States and China are locked in that race today, um, then the question then becomes, well, what do two players locked in a race for survival do to one another on the way to the finish line, right? Do they cooperate or do they fight? Um, and, and so... And know, there's going to be separate factors and factions within oh yeah. that simultaneously working for the opposite. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are going to be people who believe that, um, that uh, you know, greatness is possible for everyone um, and that a, uh, a second enlightenment is possible for everyone and that this is the, the way we should be proceeding and how we should conduct ourselves. There are those who will champion that cause. Um, you know, I'm sure you would be included among that. Um, I... I you, you know, sound like you would be I, too. My beliefs are consistent with that. No. Um, but there are those who believe that, um, that humanity will never rise to the occasion. And that, and, that, and that because humanity will not rise to the occasion, that it's a fool's errand to even think that this utopian existence is possible. And therefore, it's every man for himself.
Right. And, what is it Shakespeare that said the fool is off the wise? Yeah. So, so uh, that's true. You know, uh, it, it may be, let's hope, uh, let's hope it is. Um, because well, do you feel that there's a, like Moronova states that there's this natural biological and genetic activity happening perhaps due to our location in space and the subtle energy shift and we're subtle energy bodies right we're affected by very minute shifts of vibratory rates um, and we're finding that out through science now too that that might also circumvent that more for lack of a better egocentric um, path of the dominance rather than the stewardship. Yeah, I, as I said, I don't know how this will play out. Um, I do know um, that change is coming. I know that it's going to be radical. I know that it's going to redefine life as we know it. Um, I feel confident and comfortable in, in these assessments. Um, mm -hmm. How humanity will respond to these changes um, is something that is really beyond my ability to predict. I don't, um, I don't know how humanity will respond. Um, I believe that we're capable of responding in either direction, mm -hmm. both a positive direction and a negative direction. And um, there, you know, there are other issues that, that concern me um, besides the ones that we've talked about. One is the malleability of the human brain which in, in one sense is, is uh, a source of great strength um, in our ability to think and imagine and be intuitive and, and discover uh, and uh, um, progress through life um, is the nature of our brain. But our brain is also a double-edged sword. It has an Achilles heel. And the Achilles heel is that our brains receive millions of bits of information. We receive, it's been estimated, 11 million bits of information per second. Um, and this is happening throughout our lives. Yeah, 70,000 thoughts a day. Yeah, yet our- As a result our, of that. Yet our conscious brain can only process 15 to 50 bits of information per second. And so what that tells us is that roughly 99% or more of the information coming into our brain is coming in outside of our conscious awareness, right? And so that creates an opportunity for manipulation and misinformation, right? Absolutely, on, on the lower levels of the consciousness of humanity, absolutely. When we consider the other, the nine dimensional framework that and acquiescing to it, then the um the distillate the distillation of that information is perhaps a bit more functional in that path towards a, a greater good well the the uh the concern that i have is that um you know we've learned more about the human brain in the last five years than the last five thousand years um we have social media today uh which has an absence which of isn't so social which, yeah, which has an absence of gatekeepers, right? right? Which means that anyone can reach anyone with their phone, on their phone, and transmit messages to that individual, um, some of which will be received consciously, but the vast majority of which will be received unconsciously, outside of their conscious awareness. Um, and that information will come into their brains and essentially can... Um, distort their their view of reality mm -hmm. um and e e without them even knowing that, well, that you bring up the essential things to be aware of yeah right? because yeah. it allows you know there's this the participant and the observer right you have to in some way shape or form find that place where you move out of the push and pull and access what Csikszentmihalyi calls flow uh, in that the data stream is a bit more defined and available for the awareness to pick 
up on rather than the distractions of the the lower capacity of the brain the reptilian brain for instance where it's more fear-based as opposed to um optimistic brain based or some even call it love based yeah well again you're talking about how to access um a higher level of thought right and um i i think that that's you know um something that's very powerful mm -hmm. um, to the extent that someone is able to practice it right um for the average person um i would say that um what they need to know is they need to understand the um double-edged nature of their brain they need to understand its immense capacity for um finding the truth but they under they need to understand that the brain is not just a finder of truth it is also an advocate for that which the brain already believes which in large part is because of the subconscious input the right. information that has come into the brain outside of their awareness that makes the brain believe certain things and makes it you know for example if 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 my brain is being exposed to media that is constantly telling me that the world is a certain way right and everyone i know is also echoing that same sentiment and repeating that to me right then my brain is going to come to believe that this is reality right mm -hmm. and but, um howard bloom gets into that in the lucifer principle and how he presents the historical um activity of small groups of people that manipulate masses by telling them lies and controlling the media stream to do so whether it be a town cry or the internet yeah well i think that's happening today absolutely yeah and uh it's been happening forever perhaps but it's it's we now have tools that allow us to weaponize disinformation and so you have to be able since you can't be proactively guarding against this really because vast amounts of information are coming into your brain whether you guard against them or not they're right. still coming in you have to you have to retroactively examine your thoughts that that and your beliefs mm -hmm. and interrogate them absolutely you gotta yeah. put your truth on the shopping block and whack away of it yeah now, yeah i get a bumper sticker you'll love um i've had it for decades it's critical thinking the other or um yeah the other or, or um, america's other deficit yeah something like that yeah yeah um and, and it's true and well and it's very it's very true i mean um there was a there was a pisa study um one of the most comprehensive studies of uh of education and it found that um something like only 13.5 percent of 15 year olds in the united states can tell the difference between fact and opinion mm. uh, and and on a on a global scale it's something like nine percent only nine percent of 15 year olds can tell the difference between fact and opinion you know that you're talking about ed, the briefly on that the kind of the educational system right yeah and one of the things uh, marrying a woman from saint petersburg russia who went through their system uh, you know they picked people very young she was um concert pianist accompanist the uh, world class she's played for Mikhail Baryshnikov and Patrick Swayze in her younger years but played at that level all right some this is what Urban Laszlo did too he was a piano uh, prodigy pianist played all over the world and he saw the difference music made in the sensations of the audience and so he started studying consciousness as a result well from talking with her and actually knowing a little about the educational system in Russia to begin with they assess align aptitude and attitude early on and they promote that throughout their system they give it a well-rounded experience this is in completely contrasting what we do in America right we don't yeah. assess the kids we put them in a box we teach them the same things we expect them to regurgitate the facts and figures and we don't necessarily teach them how to critically think let alone get involved in group dynamics no 
in, not only do we not assess them, um, but then we send them into uh, predatory situations where for-profit institutions sell them on educational packages that don't actually advance their lives and then they become saddled with debt and then the government takes over and pays this debt and gives the institutions that were the predators in the first place compensation for having sold this person this un we are so much on the same page with that and yet you know, and in order to do so they give them promises as as to oh yeah you're going to be able to you know fill in the blank yeah as a result of that and then when it comes down to it you know i've got two master's degrees in business i was sold that i thought then you can tell my mind is a little off you know i'm on the fringe in, in comparison with population i'm okay with that i'm weird i love it and at the same time i needed the credibility those pieces of paper would give me in order to have that uh listening ear to a greater yeah. degree you know that that just yeah. seems, you ought to be able to just hear what i'm saying and take that not has have to look at all the accoutrements that i bring along with it and miss my miss me in yeah. the process well even so worse you. even worse than your situation where you at least got two business degrees there are kids that are going in and getting degrees in gender studies for which there is no employment right I, they're, 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 you know, racking up $50,000, $100,000 in debt. They have a, a gender studies degree, and then they go out and try to get a job, and they get hired by Ann Taylor as a, as a sales clerk that, <laughs> that would never have required the college degree in the first place, right? Yeah. And so what, what was the benefit of that $100,000 in debt? How could that institution sell that to this uneducated person Right. Um, and in, instead of providing better guidance in terms of a, a degree that would allow them to have more gainful employment, for mm -hmm. example. Right. Or at least explain to them that, right. you know, this this degree, if it's for personal, it's it's one thing if you're an adult and you have the financial uh, flexibility or, or foundation to say, I want a degree in gender studies because I want that personal enrichment i want that information you know right. that's great more power to you if you can make that rational decision if you're an adult um if you understand the consequences of of that uh debt if you're not looking to offload that debt to others right um and you're making that choice great but if you're an 18 year old kid who's coming in and really needs to be given some guidance and direction about how to get ahead in life. And who's gullible and naive enough to believe just about anything you'll tell them if you say it convincingly. Yeah, I mean, then I think it's actually pretty criminal to be selling that person a degree in something that is not going to translate right. into uh, gainful employment or any kind of increase in earning capacity. Now here's something that you bring up that is one of the, the core uh, of live and let live uh, of our two principles and, and you know we've got many movements and things like that have a litany of details or, or numbered items that, of rules right well we just got two and those two are don't be an aggressor and be a good human the don't be aggressor side of it is a legal principle and ultimately what our intentions are, are to raise awareness and the ability of people in all locations to address the laws and legislature in their areas to remove all aggressive activity from governments on down. You're talking about the corporations of school levels that are aggressors toward, you know, this is coercion, yeah. right? That's an aggression. Yeah. And so these, this is going to take a long time. And so we, we need to be aware of that, right? There's processes and systems. Everything's a process when we understand it to be so. And then there's the good, be a good human side, which allows us to bring together people and provide them ways and means to support themselves through providing programs that offer some financial rewards by yeah. doing so. And so these are one of the things, especially in Africa. Um, so these kinds of things as a global peace movement you gotta in order to have peace you can't have poverty right because there's still going to be warring amongst those 
it's going to take a while, but these are, you know, a couple of the critical things that are available to do so. And, and perhaps even one of the reasons why you were, uh, or your assistant found us and, and connected us in, in this way, because we're on the same page. We've all got threads in the tapestry that we're co-creating together sure. to move forward in a way that promotes humanity flourishing. Right. And there are some structural changes, uh, many, many structural changes that need to occur um, in our political system, in, Absolutely. in our economic system. Um, I mean, just the, the, the nature of uh, corporate law, for example, how we structure a corporation sure. where the obligation of the officers and directors, they have a fiduciary obligation, uh, not to the public, not to the planet, not to humanity at all, but to their shareholders exclusively, right. Right. exclusively. Now the ISO group also came out with something to counteract that in 2010, they published their uh, ISO 26,000 social responsibility standards, right? And I know you're familiar with the ISO group. They have a 9,000 series that's used for um, government contracts and quality control, especially in the aerospace and military defense budget area. And it's their certified, uh, documents basically that a corporation has to go through in order to meet the quality standards necessary for them. Sure. The ISO 26000 is different. It's intentional instead, but it offers guidelines that then employees can say, hey, this is a great thing and move it, you know, kind of a grassroots effort up through the chain of command in hopes that they will be become stewards as opposed to uh, feeders. Right. Yeah, so um, ultimately, I think that uh, you can reform the way corporations are structured um, so that there is some component of, of a corporate responsibility um, that goes beyond the shareholders, right? Not that you eliminate shareholder responsibility, but that you augment it with mm -hmm. some measure of contribution being mandated by all corporations, like a public benefit corporation. Right, or even close the tax loopholes that we currently have that allow them to offshore billions of dollars that they're not yeah. paying in taxes, which could retrofit so many things. Yeah. And yet even taxing is yeah. considered to be aggressive. Yeah, or change our educational structure um, to a point, I mean, we don't need uh, 250,000 people teaching algebra, right? We can, uh, there are technological methods, uh, AR, VR, XR, um, video learning, we're using it right now. Um, there are means through which the entire planet could be educated, right? Using technology. Absolutely. And, you know, sure, it may not be... There's still systems that need to be in place. One of the situations we have in Africa is the internet's so spotty yeah. that it's often really difficult. So has to be those kinds of things have to be addressed first in order to be yeah. able to you know, yeah. um, have the deliverables. Yeah. So there are a lot of systemic changes that are going to be required. And um, the good news is, is that we have a younger generation that's coming up behind us. They're more technologically advanced and aware. Um, they, uh, uh, it's, it's second nature to them to be using technology mm -hmm. uh, to create increased efficiency. And they and, appear to be more creative and innovative as a, as a result. Yeah, I'm not sure about that, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh you know, let we can hope. Let's right, hope right. they're more creative. Well, some of the, the I think our generation, I think our generation was pretty creative and innovative. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But, but that was I, a predecessor for them. Yeah. I don't doubt for a minute that they are capable of, of uh, being more so. Um, and, but in the youth, uh, do they have the wisdom to be? Yeah. Well, one of the things, one of the things that um, on that issue of youth and wisdom and uh, do they have that wisdom, I heard... Uh, Kanye West recently say something to the effect of, you know, if you're under 30, if you're over 35, I don't care what you have to say, right? Like he only cares about what the under 35 have to say. Now, well, this is a, a completely, complete conflict with indigenous philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Even, you know, it's I, ridiculous. I yeah. And my it's wife ridiculous. says, even in Russia, they have a, a, a 
just an outstanding respect for their elders yeah. in America. We don't. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the, um, it's one of the fundamental principles of, of, um, a great and advanced culture is a respect for, um, the wisdom that is acquired only through age, the perspective right. that is acquired only through age. Right. So you may be, you know, incredibly bright. Um, but if you're an incredibly bright 30 year old, you lack the perspective of an incredibly bright 60 year old. Right. Right? Unless you say like the entrepreneurial right. philosophy, right? You want to go someplace, you find somebody that's already there and you go ask them how they got there. Yeah. Well, exactly. it's, actually, it's actually a two way street, right? The, the 30 year old the brilliant 30-year-old lacks the perspective of the brilliant 60-year-old, and the brilliant 60-year-old lacks the perspective of the brilliant 30-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the answer, the answer is not to, you know, disregard any group or think that you can't learn from someone else, right? The answer is to understand how little you know, to embrace your own ignorance, and to recognize that our that alternative perspectives are not threats. They're assets. They imbue assets. life with greater understanding. Yeah, yeah. The more, the more information that you can collect, the more alternative perspectives that you can be exposed to, the greater you are likely to understand any subject or any issue. And so um, that's another important thing for people to learn is that, um, you know, treat these alternative perspectives as assets. Don't treat them as threats. So if somebody disagrees with you, if somebody sees the world differently than you do, then open your mind to receiving that information. Try to understand their perspective. You're only going to be enriched by a perspective that you don't share or you don't have. And, and then once you've gathered that additional information, you'll be in a better position to arrive at the truth, whether it's, right. it's the truth that you had beforehand it's a truth that's been modified by what you've received. It's a truth that, you know, uh, you've received disconfirming information that's changed your position. Um, any number of things can happen from receiving that information. Mm -hmm. The important point is receive the information gratefully, gratefully and gracefully. There's a number of groups that I belong with uh, or to in the conversations that we have, have a baseline of acknowledging that this is a psychologically safe and intellectually humble environment. Yeah. What that means is you can say anything you want and you won't be judged for it. And you need to listen to what others say and not judge them for it yeah. either so that we can have an open discussion about the perspectives and, and explore the understanding of each other. I have a, a dear friend, mentor, 20 years my seniors, worked at the um, international level. He did facilitations for the, uh, uh, oh gosh, um, what's the global organization? i having a senior moment here. The, uh, the, UN, uh, the UN. Yeah, thank you. Gosh, so simple and yet so far away. Uh, what, and he's an arbiter and mediator. He was president of the American Society for alternate dispute resolution for a while he says you know there really is no conflict there's just misunderstanding two people or other groups come to the table speaking from and listening with different dictionaries yeah often Mr. saying the same thing but not realizing it until you explore the other person's perspective stephen covey's seven habits the fifth one understand before being understood these kinds of things that are imperative for not just collaboration, but cohesion in a community are essential. Yeah, this comes from also a failure in communication um, and, and a, uh, a listening deficit. Mm -hmm. um, I was, uh, um, a great example of this occurred with me yesterday. I was on the phone with Cox Communication. And uh, I was having a problem with my internet. And I was speaking to a, um, a uh, retention specialist because I was going to be leaving Cox 
unless they corrected the problem of, of my poor internet service, right? right? And so I'm on the phone with this re retention specialist and the man is not listening to what I'm trying to tell him. Don't you just hate it when that happens? He's instead just talking and, and continuously talking and not listening um, to the point where I'm asking him, you know, I hope that this is recorded, right? I hope that you're recording this because, um, you know, the, had the same thing happened with, with in two different other calls. And, and I had to get to the place where, you know, you're not listening to me. You're not reflecting that you're hearing anything yeah. that I'm saying. You're going through your scripted process yeah. and I'm an, uh, I'm being ignored in the process. Yeah, that's well, that's the problem is that they that these companies hire people who don't have the uh, capacity to think on their feet. Cognitive so, skill set. Yeah, they're going through their checklist, right? They have a checklist that's in front of them and they're just going down that checklist. And, and it's almost as if, um, you know, they're, they're these high pressure, pressure salesmen, there are high pressure salesmen that will get on the phone, telemarketers, mm -hmm. and they'll sell people. And sometimes what they'll do is they'll take a phone that you normally have the earpiece, right, that's by your ear and, and the mouthpiece that's in that you speak into. Well, some of these salespeople will take the phone away from their ear, right? And they'll just be speaking into the phone. They won't be listening at all, very intentionally. Yep will not be listening to anything that the that the homeowner or the the other person on the other side of the phone is trying to say right. a lot of the trader movies show that they epitomize those guys where they're not listening to the thing to the other, yes. to the other yeah. person they're just driving the sale yes right. exactly exactly so um we need to learn to listen uh we need to learn to value alternative perspectives we need to understand our profound interdependence with one another. Um, we need to realize that, um, you know, Milton Friedman at the University of Chicago won his Nobel Prize for the observation that people operate out of self-interest, right? We do What's think, in it for me? What's in it for me? So, you know, a great way to persuade someone to do something that you want them to do is to explain to them why what you're asking them to do is in their self-interest, not in yours, Up not front. in someone else's, but in theirs, right? right? So you want to, you want to, you want to, you want to say, you want to cure homelessness? Instead of telling people how bad homeless it is for the homeless, right? Tell them how bad homelessness is for them, right? What it's going to do to them, how it's going to degradate their businesses, how it's going to make for a more unsafe and unsanitary society, how disease and pestilence can grow out of these abject poverty circumstances, how these become tinderboxes of discontent that can upset the social equilibrium, that can cause their wife to be, you know, uh, uh, um, threatened in the parking lot of a grocery store. Yeah, or just uh, scared to walk down the street. Exactly. And, and make them understand why it is in their self-interest to address the problem. If you it's don't unfortunate we have to, you know, that people can't be so caring and compassionate. Now, this is the other thing, you know, my wife and I, we just, you know, we want to keep all perspectives. We don't adhere or even like the Agenda 21 um, or, or the globalist agendas that may, you know, be similarly called. But he says in, in his COVID-19, The Great Reset, can people be caring and compassionate coming out of, right? That's the question. And, and that's what we're speaking of right now. On the flip side of that, I have another friend who's a comedian, has been one for 35 years, Jewish comedian, of course, you know, all the good ones are. And he says, you know, what we need is an upwising for the great we set. Mm -hmm. Because this, the ego has to transcend to we go now in order for us to survive, let alone thrive. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, but I, um, I would think that we would learn. From, from, <laughs> One would think. From, from decades of, of um, less than successful efforts mm -hmm. to address some of these issues 
solely on the basis of compassion, right? I, we would wish that that would be enough, but we, we should understand the reality that we've experienced for decades, which is that it is not enough, right? It is not enough. People do in fact operate out of self-interest. And so instead of continuously trying the same, it, as Einstein pointed out, if you're, if you're doing the same thing over and over and over again and it's not working, that's the, ver you know, that's the definition of insanity. Well, if you keep harping on people to be more compassionate and address the world's problems out of, purely out of compassion, right? And that hasn't worked for however many decades, right? Then maybe it's time to acknowledge that, that a slightly different form of communication Absolutely. Right, may be more effective at penetrating the psyches of some of these resistant people right? Maybe mm -hmm. some people, some portion of the population needs to be, needs to have the message communicated differently, right? They don't respond to some- well, They've been apathetic, just as we've been talking about. You know, there's this tremendous amount of apathy rather than altruism. Right. So, so rather than just looking for altruism, create informed altruism create altruism out of self-interest and it it gets you to where you want to go much more quickly much more efficiently um not everyone is motivated by the same thing right um those who are motivated purely on the basis of compassion god bless them that's wonderful mm -hmm. right but not everybody acts that way so if you're trying to bring around, uh, along the rest of the world who is slow to catch that message or is non-responsive to that message, then think about tweaking the message, right? Don't change the goal, just change the way that you're, you're selling it, right? And, and uh, it, that's essentially what, what uh, I've uh, concluded out of seeing how, how the, the message that, that has been used has, has not worked. I mean, right. LA, for example, you've got 60,000 homeless people. It's, it's completely uh, democratically controlled, right? The, the, the people who are in power in California and in Los Angeles uh, walk the walk, they, they talk the talk, right? They, they say they wanna solve all these problems, right? They believe that these problems should come to an end. They're in control, but they're not solving the problems. You still right. have all these homeless people, why? right? Why is that happening? So, you know, hold people accountable, expect them to deliver results. And if they are unable to get buy-in from their community in the, uh, from the way that they have delivered their message historically, then modify the message and make people understand that, you know, having skid rows uh, all over your major cities um, is going to ultimately result in a deteriorating economy. Mm -hmm. it, is also, it is ultimately going to harm these people's businesses. It is ult ultimately going to raise the threat level to these people's families, right? And so when, you, when, when they are made to understand that, when they are made to understand how it will affect them and their loved ones who aren't homeless, Right. right. Then maybe they'll begin to understand the need to respond. Well, and there's coming from the other, you know, the fifth insight or uh, habit, understand before it being understood. The, the flip side of that or reciprocal side is, hey, you've elected us. We've had because of this message, we need your help in actually carrying it out because that's what you wanted us to do. And here's how you can do that. And, and granted, explaining it to uh, to them in your fashion is certainly advantageous and, and there's others as well. Um, what it does is it, it gives it, not only do the people have the buy-in, they also feel like there's par participants and contributors to the success. Yes. And that's, I think, the one of the critical factors that is missing. There's a gap in the 
the relational database that's involved, if you will, yeah. in relationship. You know, I say we're all in relationships on the ocean of emotion, seeking safe harbor through, you know, going through the turmoils and, and the tsunamis. We have that intrinsic na nature with each other where we're, we don't just depend on each other, we're in, interdependent and we need each other. Yeah, we are profoundly interdependent. Right. So um, I wanted to I wanted to just um, also uh, invite your your followers um, to a free download, right? So I'm not selling this, sure. um, but my book is available for free, and um, I'll have that information below the just in the description. Great, they can go to millennialsamurai.com and they can download the entire book, um, not just a sample or you know a paragraph or a chapter, mm -hmm. but the entire book for free at millennialsamurai.com. Um, I wrote this for my daughter and for my nephews and nieces. Um, there is nothing that I will leave my family that I believe is more important than this book. So um, I really urge you to read it um, and your listeners and followers to read it. Um, it can, you know, moments change lives. Absolutely. And of course, knowing the samurai way the last thing they do is draw the sword. Yeah. That's yeah. when nothing else works. Well, there's all kinds of other things that can work. Yeah. So, and I, I really the appreciate- samurai, The sword is your brain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so in this wonderful conversations, you brought out just a tremendous amount of, of congruence with me, first of all, and I'm sure with the audience and a practical sense of, of maybe- <clears throat> how to think about this change and it works for the 30 year old as well as the 65 year old. Yeah. Okay. Um, what kind of, you know, practical everyday moment to moment advice might you offer to our listeners that span the gamut of, of generations? Yeah. So the first thing, uh, some key takeaways would be um, open your mind. Right. Frank Zappa said that uh, a mind is like a parachute. It doesn't work if it doesn't if it isn't open. Yep. Right. And he was right. Um, picture yourself jumping out of a plane. Uh, the speed at which change is going to occur is similar to the speed of you dropping out of a plane. It's going to be incredibly rapid. Um, and the good news is, is that you have a parachute. It's your brain. Um, but the thing is, it doesn't work if it isn't open. So open your mind, receive information, um, don't see alternative uh, perspectives as threats, but see them as assets and opportunities to learn. Um, be prepared to adapt throughout your life, throughout the remainder of your life. Um, it's going to require continuous adaptation and lifelong learning. Develop a love of learning um, so that you devour information and, and um, gather as much information as possible, try to be as conscious as possible about what you're um, reading and listening to and, and seeing. Um, think critically by taking a 360 degree helicopter perspective and looking at all angles to information. Um, understand that there's a sense of urgency here. Understand that radical change is coming. Um, it's going to create very significant disruption. And uh, those who are, are able to surf that tsunami of technological change and dance with machines um, can experience an extraordinary future. And those that are closed-minded um, and that are rigid and inflexible and unable to adapt um, are going to have a more difficult time. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, choose who you want to be and who you want your children to be and, uh, and act accordingly. Um, okay. That's the best information and, and remain hopeful and believe. Yeah. Um, believe in yourself and believe in others. Um, belief is incredibly important. Um, Oprah Winfrey was interviewed in 2014 by a Stanford grad student and asked, um, how do you explain the failures of your philanthropic investments in Africa? She had built a girls school and a library and they didn't perform as expected because few came. And why did few come? And Oprah said, I learned that in order to succeed in life, you first have to believe 
in your ability to succeed. You have to have a sense of hopefulness and a sense of aspiration. So whether you believe in God or whether you believe in yourself or whether you believe in, in something else that keeps you going, um, believe I, I believe that belief is essential. And um, I've always had uh, an incredible belief in myself. Um, and it has allowed me to accomplish whatever I have accomplished in life. Um, it has been that internal belief since uh, I was very, very young. And it's never left me. It's always been with me. And it's always helped me. So um, it I... To be, uh, you know, the, the ability to have the faith, love, and trust, kind of the trin I find all kinds of trinitized fractals in life. And what you're, you encapsulated is where you put your attention intention and interaction is where you're going to have results yeah that's true very true awesome george i so appreciate the time this has been a wonderful conversation and i'm sure our audience will love it too well thank you i appreciate your having me i'm very honored and i'm hopefully we'll uh, this is just the beginning right all right Super. well thank you and best to your wife Thank you again. Namaste and in la catch. Thanks for sticking with us for this episode of One World in a New Ho New World. And I'm your host, Zen Benefiel. I will see you next time.